So it is 105 and we want to get started. For those of you that are here on time, I don't have a gift to give you, but well done. Um, there, there are complimentary back scratchers out there though, so I would encourage you to uh, collect one of those. So for those of you that are joining us streaming, uh, we are going to start up again. And I know some folks are just joining us, so just a little bit of housekeeping, a reminder that if you have questions throughout the course of this training, please call 402-580-9166 and submit your question. Or you could also submit a question online, and that's to dhhs.aging.nebraska.gov. And you'll, you'll hear a gentleman's voice on a frequent basis. Um, Eric White has been doing a brilliant job in collecting the questions and then conveying those. So um, we're very grateful to you, Eric. So if you're thinking, who's the guy that keeps asking the questions? It's, they're legitimate and it's Eric. So, Eric's a good soul. All right. Well, speaking of good souls, I am just so honored to be able to introduce our next speaker. Someone who I have known for a number of years um, that all of us know uh, as part of the planning committee and your service on the Elder Justice Coalition. So Sydney Keenig Warnke is a 25-year veteran of the Lincoln Police Department. She is currently an investigator in the Technical Investigations Unit. She investigates financial crimes, including financial exploitation of older adults and vulnerable adults. She's also a certified crime scene investigator and co-leads the Lincoln Police Department Crime Scene Investigative Unit. She received her Bachelor of Science in Sociology from the University of South Dakota, her Master's Degree in Gerontology from the University of Nebraska, Omaha, a wise decision. She got a <laughs> How was that for being shameless? And a certificate, also wise, a certificate in long term care administration from Southeast Community College. She is a Nebraska Supreme Court Commission on Guardianships and Conservatorships member. So please join me in giving a huge welcome to Cindy Kinnick Warnke. <laughs> slides in um, the slide option because this has actual case investigation information in it and I choose not to share those slides so you're just gonna have to pay attention uh, please uh, throughout the presentation um, it was a long investigation so I may not cover everything so if you have questions please um, let me know um, and I'll try to answer those um, this is going to be specifically about a senior adult investigation and the Nebraska state statute that was passed in 2016 defined the senior adult, and all you have to prove is age only, 65 and older. Um, but unfortunately, the statute did not allow adult protective services to investigate senior adult abuse, only law enforcement. So if that's the only uh, parameter that is met of 65 and older, uh, only Nebraska law enforcement will investigate as adult protective services. If it's called into that agency, they will screen that out. So I'm just going to roughly go over the statute so you kind of know what we're talking about today because this is an actual financial exploitation case that I investigated. Um, I know Tony and Claire had touched on this earlier. Um, financial exploitation defined by Nebraska state statutes, wrongful unauthorized taking, withholding, appropriation, conversion, use of money funds, securities, assets, other property of a vulnerable adult or senior adult by undue influence, breach of fiduciary relationship, deception, extortion, intimidation, force or use of threat, threat of force, and breach of uh, fiduciary by guardian, conservator, or power of attorney. Which good about the statute, it used to be very narrow, and then in 2016, when the legislation uh, revised the statutes, they made it broader, which helps us in law enforcement to investigate these uh, further. Also, I should explain the statute of limitations is now six years. The legislature expanded that also. So on November 17, 2019, um, I get a call from a local bank regarding a, an attempted $21,000 withdrawal from a 70-year-old one, uh, 71-year-old customer's account. Um, 
which good is, it's a local bank um, in technical investigation. It's what's our white collar crime um, investigative unit. And we have a lot of good relationships with them. So they'll call us directly and kind of collaborate with us, run things by us, and just say, hey, this doesn't seem right. What do you think? So this is one of the occasions that they called. Um, they said this is not in the normal um, banking practices of this customer and that um, the attempt was uh, attempted by the power of attorney who was recently appointed. And um, during the bank conversations, the brother of the victim and the power of attorney, they were all kind of in conflict. So the bank was very concerned. <clears throat> the victim, whose account was <clears throat> attempted to get the 21,000 out of, he was a hospice patient in a long-term care facility who is a Vietnam vet. Um, he entered the facility on October 8, 2019. I ask you to look at the dates because the dates are going to be very important in this investigation. Um, the administrator of this facility had reported the concerns regarding the victim's friend. The victim's friend visits him all day, every day for several hours and is not very good with the staff, won't leave the room, won't leave the victim's friend's side and is very demanding of the staff and doesn't think the staff is taking care of his friend. Um, the victim has a pancreatic cancer diagnosis which he's choosing not to uh, seek treatment for. Um, he has all kinds of disorders uh, based on his military service including post-traumatic stress. Um, he can communicate, he's mobile, and he's decisional at this time. Um, he, there's a very dynamic uh, relationship with his family. He has two adult children and he's divorced from his wife. Uh, one adult child lives in Texas, one is local, but it's a strained relationship and they don't have much contact. Um, the power of attorney assigned to the friend was on October 18th, 2019, about 10 days after he was admitted to hospice, and it was effective until October 10th, 2021. <clears throat> So kind of some of the timeline that the bank had provided me. Um, this customer um, had added the friend to the bank account in 2016 as POA. Um, the victim's friends was changed on the bank account from POA to joint owner on October 18th. Remember, 10 days after he was admitted. On November 1st, the victim's friend was changed back to POA, and November 7th is when the attempt withdrawal of 21,000 occurred. And then also on that same date, the victim's brother was added as POA, and the friend was removed as POA. And when that occurred, they were in conflict, and the victim's friend was upset that he was removed as power of attorney. as he felt his friend's brother was homeless and just taking the opportunity to take advantage of his friend. Um, the bank reported it was quite the large argument when they left due to the change. So the bank expressed that they were getting direction from the victim's friend to be put back on the account as power of attorney. During the investigation, the victim's hospice nurse reported to the bank concerns about the victim's <coughs> friends and if he really had the best interest of the victim. So the hospice nurse uh, came frequently as, the, uh, as um, also the hospice social worker and they documented every time that victim's friend was there when they were visiting. Um, excellent documentation and you'll see later what is some of the documentation they provided. Um, initially the hospice nurse when she was interviewed she thought the victim's friend had his best intentions but then as time went on and how his behavior escalated and wasn't appropriate she was questioning what his intentions were. Um, she could not provide an opinion about the victim's brother. The victim's brother uh, came from California. He was kind of living out of his car. He heard about his brother's diagnosis so he thought he would come visit. Um, didn't have a lot of money and approached his brother about giving him some money, which his brother did willingly give his money to him um, and was okay, I think, initially with having his brother on his account then changed his mind later. The bank was also concerned um, the customer may, customer may be a victim of financial exploitation either by the brother or the friend, so that's why they reported their concerns. So the friend, um, I was told when I went out to um, the facility 
that he helps a lot of veterans. Um, his wife also helps a lot of veterans, and she quit her job because she helped so many veterans. Um, he would brag about being a great person and that how he's taking care of more than five veterans. And I also learned from the administrator that um, the victim's friend was demanding that he get the victim's mail at the facility. Um, he was basically bullying the staff of the mail room. Every day he would go to the mail room. He knew the time the mail would come, and he demanded his friend's mail. Um, and they said, no, you know, your, your friend's decisional. He can get his own mail, but I'm supposed to get his mail. With all the information that I was getting regarding um, the mail, because um, I had learned that the victim was supposed to get a large settlement from Veteran Affairs based on his disabilities from um, <coughs> serving. And I wasn't <coughs> sure, but I heard approximately $100,000 that he was supposed to receive. Um, he had been working on this disability claim for years, and he had um, hired a local law firm to help him with the disability claim. So um, they were working throughout. The friend also know, knew that his, uh, the victim was supposed to get this large payout from um, the VA for his disability claims. Um, once I learned the information that uh, the friend was helping a lot of veterans, his wife had quit her job to help veterans, I went to the Veterans Administration building at 40th and Old Cheney, approximately, Williamsburg, and spoke with the uh, personnel there. <coughs> but because they're a federal entity, they would not collaborate or share anything with me. So I had to ask the uh, Veteran Affairs Office of Inspector General to collaborate and investigate with me, which they did, which then allowed them to share all the Veteran Administration's <coughs> information, including paperwork that was signed and changed, to be shared with me for the investigation. So on November 15th, um, uh, that happened, and then, so the locus, local agent is from Kansas City. So that was a little challenging that we had to collaborate, but uh, we coordinated and collaborated the ongoing investigation. The victim had two vehicles um, that he owned. One was a 1990 Silver Buick, and one was a 1995 GM uh, Sonoma pickup. Um, the victim said he was told by his friend during uh, this time that he had donated his vehicles, and the victim said during his interview he did not authorize those vehicles to be donated. Um, he said he wanted to leave those vehicles in his estate to his kids, and he uh, never signed the titles to the vehicles, and his intentions were to keep the vehicles. So I contacted the Nebraska Department of uh, DMV and got copies of the titles and the purchase agreement. And so basically on the left is the title, it's not a very good copy, but on October 19th, or excuse me, October 18th, the same day that the power of attorney was assigned, um, the friend, sign the title over to himself oh my God. Um, as POA, and then he sold the vehicle to himself for zero dollars. So he did the also to the, rear, uh, the Buick, same thing, um, signed the title over to himself <coughs> using his power of attorney and sold the vehicle to himself for zero dollars. So um, I located the two vehicles. They were at the uh, Copart Auto um, sale, and the Buick had already been sold. Um, it was sold, I learned about it on November 11th. It was sold on November 12th. Um, it was sold for $125 on an online auction to an individual in Omaha, and he ultimately, with fees and everything, paid $300 for it. So um, Cohart had gave me the information, contacted him. He's like, I didn't know it was involved in this situation. I'll give it back. I'll cooperate. So he was cooperative. The pickup was never sold. Uh, we put both titles on hold so there could be no transfer of property of those vehicles. But again, the victim said never signed uh, the titles, never authorized the sale or transfer of the vehicles. So then the victim said, um, he was presented a will from the friend. Um, I got a copy of the will, which was dated October 30th, 2019. 
in the will, a dollar was left to his daughter, a dollar was left to his son, and the remaining estate was left to his friend. 50% um, left to the friend's son if the friend didn't survive, 50% left to the friend's daughter, and the assignment of the personal representative was to the friend and the friend's wife. So um, when I was talking to the victim about this, um, he had some very colorful words, which I cannot repeat. Um, but he said he was pressured, that is not his wishes, um, and that he wanted his kids to have his estate, not anything about his friend. Um, he said he felt bad because he got very emotional, started crying, and said this is not what he wanted. Um, so that was uh, changed. He said he had another will, but it was never found. But uh, the victim suspected that when the friend went through his property in his home, that he may have intercepted it or destroyed it. So I interviewed the victim um, on November 13th at the facility. Um, it was a recorded interview. Um, again, he was um, cognitively intact, decisional. He could communicate. Um, he said he served in the Army from 1968 to 1971. Um, he had pancreatic and liver cancer. Um, he said he didn't know he had the cancer and he started getting sick and vomiting blood. So his friend had called the ambulance and insisted that he go to the hospital. And I asked him how he met his friend and he said he met his friend in anger management class at the VA. Um, so I interviewed several of the um, individuals that attended the VA class of the anger management group, including also the facilitator of the group. Um, they're all a different service in different branches of the military. Um, but what I found interesting is the facilitator of the group didn't seem to have the handle on the group because when each of the members of the group, they knew their triggers during anger management class, so then they would get angry at each other and then knew the trigger to get the other one angry too, to get back at them. Um, so there was a lot of conflict in the ang anger management group. Um, he said he knew his friend for five to six years and he gained his trust. He said he met him at the VA. Um, on the Lincoln campus and he met, met him at the smoke shack and the friend came and he said I'm here to help you I want to be your friend um, he also the friend had volunteered at the VA for quite some time what I learned during the investigation but it was um, not very long because he was conflicting with the administration of the VA because he thought he could make his own rules and not follow the rules of the VA so his volunteer time was cut short the friend was encouraging the victim to fire the law firm that was hel helping him with the settlement and go with more of a VA um, provider that could help with the settlement for no charge. Um, and he wanted to be with him and go to the meetings and um, the friend just thought, initially he thought he was had his best interest, but as time went on he learned that um, he did not have his best interest. Uh, he said the will he created was phony and he was influenced and um, when he created the, the will he felt he was incoherent because he had gotten some medication at the time that the will was created. Um, yes, yeah, so the victim was very um, informative, he could provide a lot of information um, and again he was very ashamed about someone he trusted that was doing this to him. So the VA disability claim, about the $100,000 uh, that the victim was getting was for, for post-traumatic stress, anxiety, and depression. Initially, when he li hired the local law firm, they could only get a 40% disability, then they got the 60, then they got the 70, and then they got the 80, which created the payout. Um, on September 4th, during the disability claim, um, the VA paperwork for the health care power of attorney and living will was uh, changed and all information and all authority went to the friend for the victim through the VA. And that's the information and paperwork that we had to get 
from the VA that they could share. Otherwise, if they weren't collaborating with me, if the Office of Inspector General wasn't collaborating with me, it, they wouldn't have been able to provide that information. Also, no, on November 5th, uh, 15th was the last will and testament. Um, that is when the administrator helped the victim send a letter to the friend saying all previous POAs and last wills and testaments are null and void. Um, she also helped him complete the paperwork uh, for a notification to revoke all access for the friend so he could no longer intercept any information from the Veterans Affairs or um, have authority over him. On November 19th, a letter was sent to the victim's friend revoking the POAs, as said. So as I s spoke to the hospice nurse, um, I subpoenaed the hospice records for the victim, uh, 900 pages of them. I read every single page. And she had said every time the friend was there or there was a significant event, I would document it. Um, she was a great resource and a great asset to this investigation. So if you see, it says, hospice staff and facility have concerns about the friend's involvement in patients' finance, um, affair, financial affairs. Uh, the friend produces a will he's requesting us to witness. We explained our inability to do so related to the conflict of interest. So the friend had approached the hospice nurse about witnessing the will. And um, she's like, that's against our company policy. We're not going to do that. Plus, that's not appropriate, period. Um, also, she documented that prior to the friend's visit, uh, the patient advocate was there, the social worker, and believes the patient is in need of a will. They understand the importance of drafting a will and requested the social worker to speak with the patient about the matter. So the friend was encouraging um, the staff, including the hospice people coming into the facility, saying, my friend needs a will, get him a will. And then the will that was created, obviously, he benefited from. Also, on November 7th, which was another <coughs> interesting date, because remember, that was the date um, when the 21,000 was trying to get uh, accessed. Um, upon arrival to the facility, the patient's um, friend and brother were there. Um, the staff was having a conversation. The social worker didn't interfere, but uh, they got a letter today reporting the VA that approximately $100,000 would be reimbursed to the patient and $20,000 is, is supposed to be dispersed to the agent. So at that time, the staff thought that the victim's friend had intercepted $20,000 um, as the agent from the settlement. So the victim got 80,000, the agent got uh, 20,000, and again, the staff was very concerned um, because the friend was trying to um, interfere with the mail, intercept the mail, and they felt he took the 20,000. The investigator, investigation later showed the law firm actually got the 20,000. So let's go back to the concerning withdrawals on the friend's account. So again, remember October 18th is the day of the power of attorney that was assigned to the friend. The friend uh, withdraws $800 from the victim's account that day. And remember, that's the same day that they used the power of attorney to transfer the cars to himself also. Um, on October 22nd, uh, the friend completes another withdrawal from the victim's account of $550, again signed as POA. October 24th, um, two cash deposits um, go into his personal account, one in the amount of $1,600 and another for the deposit of $500. And on November 1st, the friend completes two cash withdrawals from the victim's account in the amount of $2,300. One is $1,700 at 8.47 in the morning and one at $600, or $600 at $1,215 the same day. Um, and at $215 that same day, he transfers the money to his personal account, the friend does. Here's the bank video. Thank you. So this is the $600 transaction. 
So during the investigation, I got the uh, video of the transactions. Sometimes the friend went through the drive through to make the cash withdrawals. Sometimes he goes to the bank. As you can see in the video, he's presenting some type of paperwork and kind of educating the teller his authority, which I believe is the power of attorney paperwork saying, yes, I'm authorized to make this withdrawal and I need that $600. I also had the video of the other transaction on the same day. Um, I'm just showing you a clip of the bank video. Um, it's very good video. The vehicle that he shows up into the bank is a vehicle registered to the friend. This is the friend's appearance, um, so we can confirm it's the friend. So then we, I subpoenaed bank records for the victim's accounts and also for the friend's accounts. So as you can see, the victim, who's on hospice up above, um, there's two withdrawals on November 1st, one for 600, one for 1700. And then I subpoenaed the friend's bank account, and you can see on that same day, $2,300 cash went into his account. So we were following the money, and you could see exactly where the money left from and where the money came from, and then you can use the bank video. So November 6th is when the victim receives the large deposit. Um, on November 7th is when he tries to attempt to make the $21,000 withdrawal. So the day after he received his settlement from the VA is when he tried to make the withdrawal. And that's, again, prompted the call to us. So I contacted the bank people and they informed me. Um, so they were concerned about the $21,000, so they start asking the friend some questions. Because remember, it's not in the customer's normal banking practice. Um, they knew that it was a new POA on October 18th. And um, the friend said, I need three cashier's checks in the amount of $7,000 each payable to myself. And the bank says, um, what is this money for? Well, it's for my friend. He has some bills. And they're like, okay, we need the places the bills need to be paid to. We'll just make the checks to them. <clears throat> and he keeps talking, and he's like, well, it's actually, I didn't really want to tell you, my friend owes some bookies, so I need to pay his gambling debts. Um, and the bank's like, mm, no. So that's why they deny it to cash withdraws. Interesting enough, when I got the friend's um, bank records, there was a lot of ATM withdrawals at casinos, different casinos around the area. So um, I suspect he was going to use the money for his own gambling, but that's only a suspicion. So on November 13th, the victim removed all POAs from his bank account, and um, when he removed the friend from the bank account, the friend called the bank again and said, uh, there's a mistake. It's not supposed to be, I'm not supposed to be removed. I'm supposed to be able to have access to uh, the victim's bank account. Um, but the bank um, stood firm and did not allow access. And on December 9th, the, uh, the friend's bank account was frozen and the $2,300 was secured by subpoena. So the financial institution where the $2,300, remember he took the transaction out and put it in his personal account. When I found out, um, different financial institutions require different types of legal process to freeze accounts. Um, because I wanted to secure that $2,300 because that is a crime of financial exploitation. Uh, this financial institution only required a subpoena. Um, so I secured that 2300 so the victim's friend could not spend that money. <coughs> so when I interviewed the hospice nurse, um, she believed initially that the, friend's, the victim's friend was good in the beginning, but then um, the victim's friend was more involved in a consistent vi visitor, which was kind of a red flag to her. She said she would receive calls all day and all night from the victim's friend about his care and about assigning a medical POA. She said he was very persistent, um, always calling her, um, making demands, you need to do this, um, not only with his care, the medication, but the legal documents. Um, the victim's friend had requested the nurse to obtain a note from the victim's primary care provider stating the victim had less than six to eight weeks to live, which he did not. As hospice, 
you have less than six months to live. Um, she said, no, I will not do that. He said, you need to do that. And he would call her constantly and basically intimidate her to get the primary care physician to say he had six to eight weeks left to live. Um, the nurse said she saw the victim's friend on one of the visits with a stack of papers and with the stack of papers he was showing the victim different pieces of papers and she said it was like a shell game. He was throwing the papers in front of him so fast that she said the victim didn't even have time to read what was presented in front of him and he was directing him, hey just sign this and take it away or would never leave him a copy. Um, and again, she, the victim's friend had requested the nurse to witness legal paperwork, which she refused. So during this investigation, um, the victim starts to decline due to his uh, cancer. Um, on December 23rd, he met with an attorney and prepares a new will. Um, also during this time, he kind of rekindled an uh, old friendship relationship with a former girlfriend and um, he decided that she should be the one to make the decisions for her for him as personal representative and um, it was a good uh, meeting for them um, on one of the visits that I went and met with him I met her um, she did she was happy to be back in his life and she wanted to do everything right she worked with me and support um, on January 2nd, he fell and he started to decline and on January 7th of 2020, he no longer communicated and passed away on January 10th. On January 29th, that um, old friend that came back into his life, um, she uh, is assigned as the personal representative according to the new documents. I never asked him to see the new documents. I know an attorney came in and prepared the new documents with him. Um, and her and I should also tell you the victim's friend he didn't have an attorney or any representation he just brought in documents from online or some type of um, copies that you can get off the internet there was no um, it's just kind of a standard form so she's assigned as the personal representative to settle his estate and on February 7th the victim front the victim's friend files a statement of claim against his estate for $11,950 um, for, as you can see, removing furniture and items from his apartment for $1,350, for cleaning up the storage unit, $750, for loading truckloads to the storage unit for $950, and then for staying with his friend eight hours a day for 45 days for $8,900. Wow. So even after the victim had died, the victim's friend is still trying to get um, some money from his estate. But in response, the attorney for the personal representative uh, denied the claim. So the, victim, or the victim's friend was ultimately interviewed at the Lincoln Police Department. Um, he brought his attorney. Um, the victim um, said during the interview that he was never offered to reimburse him for the expenses that he did. Um, he said he was a helpful man and he had never taken anything from any vet veterans or he was there to help the victim. He didn't want reimbursement and oftentimes he would take money out of his own pocket to help all these veterans and get them where they needed to be. He said he helped a lot of older ladies. Um, that was obviously concerning. Um, he said he helped him take them to the doctor's appointments, give them transportation where they needed to go, and he said he was always giving of himself. He's a giver, he's not a taker. Um, when he was confronted by myself about the cash deposits into his account, he said they were from eBay sales, because he sells different items on eBay, and that I was mistaken, it wasn't from the friend's account. Um, again, I confronted him and he said, uh, what was I supposed to do when I was given all that burden? Um, he had no place to do but listen and tell me, told me. Um, that was his answer. That's a direct quote. Um, he said he wanted, um, the victim wanted him to hold the cash, but the victim was very persistent throughout the interview and throughout my contacts of the investigation. He never authorized 
the friend to take any cash withdrawals. And he also said he would be okay if the friend had taken um, some money for some gas or a, a small meal because he did do a lot of things for him and he was appreciative of that. Um, what I failed to also put is there was several debit card transactions on the victim's account uh, that was concerning. It was to fast food places, antique stores, um, other places like um, really <coughs> unique places that the victim was in the facility and was not able to go to, and some were out of town places. And so I went through the victim's um, bank transactions with him, and that was also concerning because there was transactions that he had never authorized um, and didn't say the victim should be able, or the victim's friend should be able to do. Uh, finally, the friend said, yes, I put the money in my account. Um, but he was adamant that the victim's um, friend wanted him to have that money, even when confronted when I said, you weren't authorized. And he's such a giver, but the victim wanted him to have it. Um, the victim's friend is Byron Engler. He was ultimately arrested. Um, I issued an arrest warrant for him, and the U.S. Marshals arrested him. Um, on September 1st, 2022, um, he was charged with abuse of a senior adult, which is a 3A felony, uh, regarding the five cash withdrawals for the 3720, attempt theft uh, by deception, where he tried to take the 21,000 out of more than 5,000. Um, that is also a 3A felony. And then theft, 1,500 to 5,000, a class four felony for the concerning debit card transactions that the victim had identified in the amount of $507.50. So it was basically, this case got settled just a couple months ago. Um, and um, because of the death of the victim, the prosecutor gave him a deal of a misdemeanor and he got 18 months probation. Um, but the $2,300 that I had secured uh, went back to his estate. So I just recently unsecured that and it was sent to his estate. I talked really fast. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, you can ask me questions. Yes? One online here says, uh, is there someone like you that does your type of investigation that is located in Omaha? Uh, can you recommend us? Okay, the question was, is there someone like me in Omaha? and that I could refer cases to. Um, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> the investigator that was like me in Omaha has retired. Yes, sir. Thank you for your persistence. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well said. Wow. Yes. So, was something passed recently that made, was it abuse of seniors a felony? Wasn't there something recent with that? Like in the state legislature or something they passed? So senior adult abuse was passed in 2016 where it was age only. Right. So I also should explain in the state of Nebraska, abuse of a vulnerable adult or a senior adult is an automatic felony. And financial exploitation, we don't have a threshold to meet, a, a financial threshold. So like in a regular theft case, there's certain thresholds like five to 1,500, 1,500 to 1,000, and it goes up the classification. Uh, financial exploitation, it could be a dollar, it could be a million, it's a 3A felony. Mm -hmm. And a 3A felony is zero to three in prison and up to $20,000 fine. Mm -hmm. Yes? So um, for the state of Nebraska or our area, yes. whatever, are you seeing an increase in these investigations then? Or? Yes. So the question was for the people, um, am I seeing an increase for this in my area for these type of investigations? Yes. Um, just last month, in a week, I had to freeze two bank accounts because of financial exploitation. Do, do you think, um, having gone through COVID, do you think that had any kind of impact on the increase? Um, where I'm seeing that is in the Medicaid issue uh, because the COVID Medicaid parameters were a little looser, in my opinion, um, and they didn't do asset checks and so forth. So I'm seeing, starting to see some of that. 
Plus, I'm gonna start, people are living longer. Baby boomers are living longer, they have wealth. And the other challenge is, um, I have a case where the victim is 97 and the perpetrator is 77. Mm. So then we're gonna run into an aging population in prison. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. um, that's something that's kind of unique and because people are living longer and better health care and better nutrition and taking care of themselves, now we're seeing older victims with older perpetrators. Thank you. Yes. So with him working with all these vets, was he doing the same thing to these? Oh, so I didn't get to that. So that was my biggest concern because he was working with a lot of veterans and that's why I, went, I literally drove from the facility straight to the Veterans Administration because I'm thinking how many other victims are there? Um, so the Veterans Administration, thank goodness the investigator of the Office of Inspector General researched it. He was not on any other veterans paperwork. So in what way he was helping, I don't know. But as far as working with VA and me, we did not identify any additional victims or anybody he was even helping. So does his name come across, if it would come across somebody's? Yes, the, so VA, like the VA's database, obviously, which I didn't have access to, but thank goodness I partnered with uh, the investigator with the VA. He could access that information and it did come up anyway. And it won't, I mean, if his name comes across like anybody else's paperwork. I don't on, know about that. That's up to the VA. Any other questions? Cindy, this has just been amazing. I, we all need someone like you in our lives. And we need to, to ensure that through, whether it's the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice or other programs, and we need to have more people in law enforcement uh, trained as you've been trained to be able to uh, clearly work with what's going to be a growing problem. So, very good. Let's give it up for Cindy.